Welcome to today's episode of Let's Talk. And uh, today I'm going to be joined by Pastor Colby Hill, uh, who is the pastor of our Encounter Church, and uh, Pastor John Lewis, who is the pastor of our Servants of Christ Church. And today what we are going to discuss is the issues of race, race relations, and racism within the church and within the Christian community uh, as these guys uh, uh, just open up about how we can view this and how the church can be made better. The issue is racial relations in the church. So let's talk. So uh, today, as we start talking about a new normal, um, let, let's talk about a new normal in terms of the culture in which we live, in terms of our nation. It's not a secret to anybody what uh, our nation has been going through uh, the past few weeks with the death of George Floyd, but we can go back and we can name dozens more of moments like that. Uh, this one happened to be on video and it has made a huge impact on the nation. Um, so let me start the conversation here. Um, racism or the assumption that whites would be in charge is not something new. Um, it's been around since white folks showed up here. Uh, the, the nation we know as the United States was founded uh, by immigrants from Europe, predominantly from, uh, from England or English uh, area. And, um, and the assumption's been from then until now, honestly, that the leadership would be white and the authority would sit with white people. That has created disparities and that has created, um, honestly, the situation we face today. So I know that, uh, Pastor Colby, you and I had talked, uh, you have talked yesterday and have talked before about the history of this. Uh, walk us through this, the history of this as, as you see it. Yeah, um, it's, it's hard to acknowledge that, well, I think it's good for us first to, to look at things from a larger or longer right. arc. Right. That, that the problems that we're facing now, just like you said, weren't caused even 50 years ago. Right. This goes back to the founding and even before of the country where you had the British, the Spanish, and the French all at the time uh, slave-owning countries mm -hmm. um, vying for this piece of land that we now know as the U.S. And they brought slavery, they instituted systems uh, built around maintaining power yeah. um, by having themselves be in leadership positions and other people subjected right. uh, to those systems. So, you know, I mean, you go back 1619, mm -hmm. um, before the founding of the, the, of the United States, there was slavery that existed in this country. Right. Um, and, and one of the things that's really interesting, if we want to narrow the focus to, to policing, um, police have always been kind of in existence in some form or another, but they have often been utilized by the, the power system or the government system as a means of control. Right. And, and so we often say, like the motto of the police on the side of the car is to serve and protect. And you go, yes, but you have to think of the originally established purpose was to serve and protect the regime, the right. government, the, the power structure. So um, we can look at, you know, in the, in the 1800s, slavery and policing was done primarily by um, entities called patty rollers. Mm -hmm. The Paddies was uh, uh, mainly Irish. That was kind of a, a nickname given to Irish people uh, to give the, the men a job because even amongst white people, there was a, a social status structure. And the Irish were lower than the British. And so that was a way to give them some sort of authority over black people, black and brown. And their job was to roam the countryside, the main thoroughfares, to ensure that slaves, when they were passing, had their paperwork mm -hmm. to show that they had permission to go from one place to the next, and to round up those that did not have paperwork or that just looked suspicious. Right. And so when you, when you hear about today stop and frisk in places like New York City, um, when you hear about DWB, driving while mm -hmm. black, um, 
it's more than just um, I'm seeing color and I assume that this person of color is up to no good. This is something that's ingrained in our society right. and systematic. When we talk about systematic racism, uh, the birth of it is years, but hundreds of years back, um, and now has trickled down into what we see today. I, I was I was having a conversation uh, oh last year uh, with uh, Dr. Joanne Lyon. Uh, when you when you when you paint this picture, this just popped back in my head. That exact scenario today, I was in Sierra Leone with Dr. Lyon, and they are recruiting domestic workers into Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. from Sierra Leone. Yeah. But the domestic workers to now must have paperwork to prove they have their boss's permission to be on the street or the police yeah. will take them and if they don't have permission, they will either be jailed or they will be punished or they'll be taken back. This still exists yeah. in that form. It still exists on the planet today. It's, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. We think that slavery was something that was relegated to a certain period of no. history. If systems aren't challenged and yes. really ultimately dismantled, they simply just reshape themselves and really further entrench themselves yes. in just different, less overt ways. And so, yeah, a, a friend of mine, she is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, she looks like an all-American white girl. Uh, we went to college together, and she taught English in Abu Dhabi for several years. And she would often tell me stories or post things mm -hmm. about the treatment of the people uh, in, in that area of, right. of the world. And they were bringing, at that time, it was Indians. Right. Uh, in to work in that part of the country and it was the same thing yes you know and and so other ways that this is taking place is uh, sex trafficking mm -hmm. um, that is another form of slavery right. they're they're going targeting specific people and and taking them from their home to be sold bought and sold in other parts of the country or the world right so let me let me uh, I, I, there's a phrase out there we had this conversation yesterday there's a phrase out there that uh, we need to understand from a different angle, I think, which is white supremacy. Mm. Uh, because to me, growing up where I grew up, white supremacy meant KKK, dudes in hoods, you know, the skinheads, the Nazis, that's what that meant. Yeah. But I think in today's, in, in much of today's conversation, the idea is that there has been the assumptions, there has been the assumption that white people would be in power from the birth of this nation. Mm -hmm. And therefore that creates an assumption of white supremacy, not KKK, not, but still the same problems, the same divisions. And that, those show up today. Now, Pastor John, you have done a lot of your work, uh, a lot of your ministry in prison ministries. And, um, and you are currently, I'm going to let you name the title of this because I can never remember it. It's a long title. You hold a position with the county, right, with Charles County now. It is the, uh, the courts actually have some committees to help them operate uh, a little more justly yes. to address things just like this. And so I was appointed as the uh, racial, and, uh, racial and Ethnic Disparity Chair. Of go. this particular committee, and uh, it's actually an honor to serve yes. there. I have been a part of many uh, different um, portions of our court system. Uh, we uh, point of change is a ministry that I started. You supported it. It's been around for a long time, and so we do uh, anger management court classes for the courts. Um, I was the principal for the uh, start with to helping Judge Harrington start the uh, drug, uh, the um, uh, family recovery court. So um, that, it, that is something that uh, I'm proud of. I'm excited about it. Um, it is a court that allows parents to reunify with their children after going through you know, a certain group of you know, uh, classes and so on. So I've had a lot of dealings with the courts. So this appointment is, is really something I'm looking forward to. And I have started to, to pull data to kind of help us heal. Um, I'm asking my con congregation, our, my friends, and, and anyone that will listen to me um, to write down a plan 
uh, as to what you will do to help heal this situation. When I say situation, I'm talking about all the things that are happening, all the things that are running through our minds. You know, are we still at the dinner table saying, I told you they were like that? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, right. like, like the, right. the, 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 the things we do behind closed doors, like we come out, we all politically correct, but some of us are still using the N-word in our homes, mm-hmm. blacks and whites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I look around, I'm like, this has got to be tough on a Caucasian person that doesn't think like the Caucasian people that we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> the story is, is a funny story. Pastor Mike and Chris Wagner took me out to lunch. Mm-hmm. And uh, where I'm from, if you're riding with someone, you kind of, j- when they get ready to go pump gas, you just jump out and pump the gas. <laughs> so uh, Pastor Mike's driving, he's getting ready to get out. So I get out to pump the gas. He's like, man, get back in that car. I was like, no, I'm going to pump the gas. He said, you know what would happen to me if, if, if people see a white man sitting up here and you, a black man pumping this gas? I never thought about it. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about <laughs> That would not have ended and, well for me. And, yeah, but, but do you see how yes. crazy the world is? Mm-hmm. Here's a guy that's done more for, I won't say more, but he's done a great deal of things for people of color. But because he's white, he's being discriminated against. People are, sure. they don't know who's who. Perception is yeah. everything. They, they don't, <laughs> Pastor Kobe, they don't know that you're the guy that won't loop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they don't know who we are. Right. And, 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 and that's what we have to do. The conversation is about how do we get to know each other? How, you know, what, is it, what are we doing to bridge this gap? One of the things I believe that is really uh, important for us, it's really going to make a difference, is having these conversations after the smoke clears. Right. Sure See, fine. right now, you know, people are using it to, to build fame. Some are feeling left out, and so now they want to say something. What are you doing? Because, because here's what I believe. In Christ Jesus, if you have a mind to, for, that, 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 that projects equality, you're going to get involved in a whole lot of stuff. Right. I mentioned this to you earlier, helping individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to tell my age here, but I, <laughs> y'all know, but they don't know. Um, I was involved in the first group of individuals uh-huh. that had developmental disabilities coming into group homes in Washington, D.C. I ain't going to tell you how long that was, <laughs> but they were in Force Haven. Okay. This came from a mindset of equality. This does, has nothing to do with the color of someone's skin. When Christ comes into your life, you begin to look at anything that's unfair, and you say, I want to do something about it. Right. Yeah. So, right. It, so, so right now, of course, we're upset, we're passionate, we're this, that, and the other, you know, but, but are we doing to our own brothers and sisters the same things we see other people doing to us? Right. And, and are we standing up for people who's who getting a bad rap? You know, I go out and say things like, because I'm not politically politically correct, and I'll say something like this: White people, stop feeling guilty. If you're not doing anything to hurt black people, stop running around feeling guilty. Stop writing stuff like I got uh, my black friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just your friend. It's just your friend. You know, yeah. and, and and the same with us. Stop using this moment to draw attention to us. You know, that now all of a sudden we're the spokespeople of America. There is no, and Pastor Ern used to like this, this quote, yeah. and I came up with this in case anybody out there. <laughs> there, is, there is no one race that has cornered the market on stupidity. <laughs> That's fair enough. Because, because yeah. All of us are doing dumb things, even right now. You know, we're, we're I mean, I, 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 like, I like the Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. I understood it from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, when, I go, when I go fight for individuals that are incarcerated, we, we just had a bill passed. Believe it or not, we had to fight for this. We took this bill, uh, I took about 
Uh, last year, I took, or a couple of years ago, I took about 45 uh, ex-felons to Annapolis to show them how to fight the system without a gun mm -hmm. and fight the system with a pen. Uh, we want to learn how to make laws, okay? Uh, this was a bill called Ban the Box. It later on got yeah. vetoed. Um, but just recently, we took a bill just from concept. I had a, a meeting with uh, a number of county leaders. Uh, uh, Congressman Steny Hoyer mm -hmm. uh, was there. And what we ascertained out of that meeting was that in order to help anyone coming home from uh, uh, an incarcerated state was that they had to have proper ID, because mm -hmm. that was the one missing link. And when they came out, it was either expired or whatever the case was. We sat down with regular old guys. These were not politicians. These were just regular old guys that's been out, boots on the ground, trying to help people. You get what I'm saying? Equality is not just about white and black. It's about trying to make it right for the guy that's not getting a, that's getting right. a bad shake. We took that bill. We sat down. We said, hey, how would it be crafted? What would it look like? OK, the, the concept of me. We want <clears throat> them to have ID before they come home. We took that bill, I may have these numbers wrong, but I believe it was something like, uh, we took it to the House as something like, uh, maybe like Bill 150 or something be, be presented. I brought up uh, uh, individuals that have been incarcerated to testify uh, on, on the bill. Um, it got bar, bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went over to the House. I believe it came over to the House as, um, well, maybe it started at 77 and ended up as 150. Anyway. But unanimous decision, this bill went to the governor's desk. Listen to this. Most people don't know that they can change the world that quickly. Right. They think we have to fight it out they don't, because they don't know another way. So why not make our next steps to be educating people that you know, they don't understand that they can do this, that, and the other. You see what I mean? I don't want to go over the tongue, no, no, but, you're, you know, thanks for letting me get yeah. that out. I think, I think in the end, disruption demands change. That's why protests have been so important in the history of our country. Yeah. Disrupt, disruption demands change. But peace, peaceful measures, like everything you've just said, peace allows the implementation of the change that was demanded. Uh, but you you have to have a sense that that change is coming, or you're not going to get past disruption. Yeah, the the disruptions create the awareness and the urgency for the change, and so you know I, I I try and encourage people not to get so distracted by the the unrest that's taking place mm -hmm. because what comes after it, what you're talking about, that's you've got to right. prepare for what's coming after that, right. and that is. Let's work together. Let's let's legislate, um, not not theocratically legislate, right. but every piece of legislation I hope um, has comes from a faithful perspective, because we can infuse faith into the legislation, and so we can't be reticent to be a part of the political process because that's what this country is founded on. Well, the the, the legislation has got to happen to change the policy practices. Mm -hmm. You can't legislate a good heart into somebody that's got a bad one. Right. You know, and, um, but, but that's, in the end, I, I don't know, I think somehow, somehow Dr. King's words judge people by the content of their character, not yes. the color of their skin. Yes. Uh, I, I, think it, I think those words could probably never be more appropriate than right now, uh, because, because We've too often assumed things about people, whether we're police officers or whether we're folks working at the hospital or whether we're folks at the church. We've too often assumed things about people just because of the color of their skin. That's true. And um, it, it leaves disparities. Pastor Mike, let me, let me ask you a question. Like, mm -hmm. at times like this, I mean, you being a person that has done as much as you possibly can for people of color, you know, how does it make you feel that a lot of people of color look at you and say you're a part of that white supremacy group. Well, no, it's, it's, oh, I mean, and not that they would say that, but you, <laughs> well, no, they've said that, <laughs> they've said that. Um, it's, you know, look, l l let me just say this and then let me explain it. Um, it's frightening. 
because because you cannot defend something that is not based in reality to start with. You know, so there's no defense. Uh, if, if this accusation is thrown at me and it sticks at any point, there's no defense for that, so it's frightening. But let's be very clear about this. I am, I am frightened and at risk of losing my job, my career, my church. Um, you know, George Floyd was at risk and fear of losing his life. So is it real? Yes, it comes back at me and it comes back at me like that and it leaves me being, feeling afraid and insecure and sometimes afraid that I'll, I'm not gonna talk because I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. All that happens, but that's awful light and momentary com comparatively. Yeah. So is it real? Yes. Is it, is it anything compared to what's going on in the black community? Uh, no, no, it's not. And we have to be honest about that. I think my role here is to, in, in Southern Maryland, in this conversation, is to, is to say this is real. BJ brought this up yesterday in a conversation we were having. And, um, you know, this nation was not founded, this nation was not founded for people that were not white. It was founded for people that were white. And that was a mistake. You know, these people that founded our nation were brilliant and they put a lot of brilliant things in place. This was a mistake. And, um, and I, you know, it leaves us where we are now. So thanks for joining us today. Look, as a result of this conversation, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I'd like to ask you to create and build relationships with people that are not like you. And I'd like to ask you to read and grow in your thinking about these issues uh, on the relationship side. Actively work at building a relationship and having these open, honest, and in humility, understanding conversations between people of different races. Learn from one another what words mean and what effect words have. Just do the work of getting to know someone that's not like you. It will go a long way towards settling this issue. Uh, one person, two people at a time. That's the only way we're actually gonna get this to work out. Number two, uh, read. Read in areas that you're not familiar with. Uh, far too often, we have a general thought, we wanna believe this, so we only seek out material that say what we wanna believe intentionally look for material that's from another perspective, that's from another side. Find a way to grow your thinking so that you can think more broadly about these issues. Now, if today's been helpful to you, we wanna ask you to uh, like it, to follow it, to subscribe, to comment, whatever you can do to help us get the word out about these programs. We wanna help people think better, and in order to help them think better, we're gonna sit down and ask him to talk with us.